And now, let me introduce our host for the evening, Globe and Mail crime and fiction reviewer, Margaret Cannon. Welcome, Margaret. Thanks to all of you for coming out tonight, and it's a pleasure to be back here. Uh, it's a big pleasure for me to introduce uh, one, of the, one of Canada's best known and most loved crime writers, Linwood Barclay. Uh, like me, Linwood is an ex-American, uh, or shall we say, former American. Uh, he was born in Connecticut, but he grew up in Bob Cajun. Uh, yes, it's a great story, and I'm going to let him tell it because he's funnier than I am. And uh, uh, from Bob Cajun, he went to Trent. From Trent, he went to the Toronto Star. And many of us uh, remember uh, turning every three, once every three, two or three days to his wonderful columns in the Star, his humor columns, which featured his wife, Neetha, and his children, Spencer and Paige. Um, was great fun, and it led to three very, very uh, good books. Uh, and uh, eventually to a book about his childhood, which, which was a finalist for the Leacock Prize. So from humor to mystery, how do you get there? Well, I'm going to let him tell you himself. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome tonight Linwood Barclay. Thank you. There's all these people who could not get TIFF tickets tonight. Um, <laughs> I'm very sorry about that. Uh... We'll, we'll do our best. Now, you know, I want you to tell everybody how you came to mystery novels, beginning with uh, uh, your romance with the great Canadian novelist, uh, Ross MacDonald. Well, um, I'd always liked, loved crime fiction from, you know, I think the first novels I really got into were The Hardy Boys. And, and I just devoured those. Remember when they were the little small hardbacks? And, you know, the paper, that, that crafty paper that the, crumbled. Yeah, the tower treasure and the house on the cliff, all those things, and I would just devour them. And then and Tom Swift, too, which was sort of sci-fi. And then as I got a little older, I discovered, uh, I, around grade five, I discovered Agatha Christie, and then I was reading all the Rex Stout novels. And then about the time I was 15, I was actually, my, in Bob Cajun, which you mentioned, um, our bookstore was the, the twirling metal paperback rack at the IGA. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you think bookstores might be disappearing now. That was our bookstore. It was this twirling rack. And it squeaked like hell. You know, you would turn around and, like, and, and my, my eye was caught by a paperback bantam edition of the goodbye look by Ross MacDonald, and it had this blurb on the front, the finest series of detective novels ever written by an American, which was the, from the William Goldman Review in the New York Times. And so I read that, and I just, and I just loved, I loved it. And then I just devoured every Ross MacDonald novel I could get my hands on. And I think part of the appeal was, I mean, first of all, he was this guy who was taking the conventions of the mystery novel and doing more with it. You know, he was, he was exploring all this family dysfunction and, and so forth. And, I don't know if I fully realized at the time just how dysfunctional my own family was, but it was fun to read about other families that were even worse. <laughs> you know, they were, you know, who were really a mess. And, and, um, and once I got to, when I was in university, I wanted to do a, a thesis on the, the, the private eye as an iconic character, but really focusing on, on Ross MacDonald's Lou Archer. And so I decided to write him a letter, care of his publisher, and asked if there were things that had been written about him I should know about and so forth. And he wrote back, and, and then I did this awful thing, which is I wrote him back and I said, you can say no, and I totally understand if you say no, but I've written a novel, and could I, could I, could I send it to you? And he wrote back and he said, sure. Gosh. And so that was the beginning of a very long, he read a couple of books I wrote, and we had a very long correspondence, and it kind of culminated with, he was in Canada at one point, around the time that the Blue Hammer was coming out, and he came up to Peterborough, and, he, and I was running this cottage resort trailer park at the time, and I think I had just finished burying the fish guts, and <laughs> there was a phone call, and it's Kenneth Millar, who was you know, Ross MacDonald's real name, and he was in Peterborough with his wife, Margaret, did I want to come over and join them for dinner? 
And since the fish guts were buried, I could go. Um, <laughs> and so I had a, this amazing evening with, like, this would be like any other normal kid in Canada getting to spend an evening with Wayne Gretzky, but I wanted, this was, this was the guy I idolized more than anybody else on the planet. And I gave him a tour of Trent University and had dinner with him and, and so forth. And it was just, it, it's still one of the most memorable, amazing evenings I ever had. But it was, he was, he was very encouraging. And, and he was a kind of, you know, he was a mentor to me at that time. So... When, but, but you didn't go straight into mysteries. No, I, but I was writing them then. I, was, I mean, I was writing crime novels in my teens. I, I really thought what I wanted to do was be a writer of TV scripts. But, you know, I was hooked on everything from Columbo and Mission Impossible. And I'd love to write those shows, which it was not a huge demand for that in Fenland Falls where I was going to high school. <laughs> but despite that, I thought I would like to do it. Um, and, uh, but then as I got you know, into, my, into my early 20s, then I, I was writing novels. And, and, I was, I was, and I was sending them off, and I was rejected by some of the finest publishing houses <laughs> around. And, and it became clear to me that I was not, my plan was to leave Trent University and just become a best-selling novelist. Um, <laughs> it didn't quite work out. Um, and none of those books were published, and we can all be grateful for that, <laughs> especially me. Um, so I thought, well, where can I get paid money to write every day? And so I went and I got a job at the Peterborough Examiner when I was 22. And I spent two years there, and then I was two years at a small paper in Oakville, and then, uh, and then after that, I got to the Toronto Star in 1981. And you were at the Star for a long time. I was there for 27 years. Um, I didn't do the column for that. I was hired. At the start, I went in, you know, looking for a job, and they said, you know, as a reporter, and they said, well, we don't, we don't need any reporters. We, what we need are copy editors. We're desperate for copy editors. Do you have a lot of editing experience? And I said, uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I got hired working on the city desk as a copywriter, and I, and I soon, I was, you know, before long, I was assistant city editor. I was news editor. I was the... Um, uh, I was the chief copy editor for the paper. I was the life section editor for a few years. And I didn't start doing the column until I'd, I'd been at the Toronto Star for 12 years before I started doing the column. And I'd started doing that in 1993 and did it for 14 years, three columns a week. Um, I don't think people realize, not only do you have to have a lot of experience to write a column and keep it fresh three times a week, but you gotta have a lot of talent to make well, I don't the know. simple things fun. <laughs> and I, I, you know, like, I, I still remember there, and I know there are people out there, we all have a favorite column that we remember. My favorite was the big box store. Your first encounter with that. Oh, but, but there were also, I mean, Spencer and Page School, uh, oh, yeah. the crises of adolescence, uh, uh, wonderful, wonderful things that, uh, that kept going. Yeah, about a, third, about a third of them, I think, were family ones. And yep. then another third were just sort of everyday life. And uh, probably at least a third were sort of political yeah, satire. Mike, Mike Harris, the gift I did a lot did. of Mike Harris calls. <laughs> <laughs> I did a lot One of One misses those. you now with Ford. <laughs> you know, it's funny. When I left the Star in 2007, I figured, well, Mel Lastman's no longer mayor. <laughs> Never again will there be a guy that good to write about. <laughs> it, it, it seems so safe to leave at that point. <laughs> but you know, what, what could you do? Like, I mean, Calvin, one of my favorite writers in the world is Calvin Trillin. And Calvin Trillin, who writes wonderful satire, says one of the risks in writing satire is that things that you will write to lampoon events will actually be overtaken by actual events. <laughs> and, and that's what would have happened. Like, why could you write about this current mayor? Because anything that you would write, none of it would be as outrageous as what's actually <laughs> happening. <laughs> so I still think I made the right call to leave when I did. <laughs> now, your first mystery novels were recognizable. Like, we understood Zach Walker, who was the, the, the uh, uh, protagonist of the first uh, four, I believe, yeah. uh, was a science fiction writer living in the suburbs with a young family. And we sort of understood them. But then 
you took a real detour. Uh, and I want to talk about that detour. Uh, it was, uh, I've got it written down here, no time for goodbye. And it begins with a, uh, it's the story of a woman who woke up one morning and her entire family was gone. Now, what made you leave the sort of lighthearted mystery of Zach Walker and head for something a lot more sinister? Well, nobody was buying the Zach Walker books. <laughs> So it wasn't a really difficult decision. <laughs> I had done, I mean, I wrote four novels about Zach, and I really love those books. I'm very proud of them, and they're, I think, really great books. And the nice news is they're, they're, now, they're all still in print, and they're selling, and because people are discovering them having found their more recent books. But at the time, you know, I wrote the four Zach novels, and collectively they sold about, like, 22 copies or something. <laughs> and, and my agent had said, you know, maybe it's time to go in another direction. Stop writing funny, because really, I mean, when you look at the genre of comic thrillers. <laughs> no, no, but. Yes, yes, No, but I mean, really, right. like, there's, there's Janet Ivanovich. Like, I'm talking about best-selling comic thrillers. You, there's Janet Ivanovich, and then that's where the list kind of stops. <laughs> there used to be this, the magnificent Donald Westlake, who wrote yes. the, the Dortmunder books, but, but comic thrillers are not typically a big part of the market, and, and the feeling was it was time to go maybe to do a standalone thriller and to do a dark, darker kind of material. And, and my agent said, and, I, and this is kind of the way I've always gone ever since, is you, know, you need a really great hook, you need a great idea. And, and I finally woke up one morning at five and I had this idea about a girl who's 14 years old who goes out with a bad boy one night and comes home totally drunk and her parents are outraged and furious with her and she goes to bed and, and, and she wakes up the next morning and everyone's gone. Like her mother's gone, her father's gone, her brother's gone, and 25 years go by and she's never known what happened to them. And, you know, were they all killed or did they decide to leave and not take her with them? And which would be worse? You know, to find out that everyone in your family was dead or that they had left you and, and didn't, behind and didn't want you. And so I sent an email to my agent at 8.30 in the morning and said, how about this? And she called immediately. She said, that's it, that's a great <laughs> hook for a thriller. And she said, and she likes to know the whole story. She said, what happened to the family? I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, ha I have no idea. <laughs> but, but, you know, she said, and it was true, you'll figure that out. And I did. And that book, I couldn't have known. Like, that idea came to me at 5 in the morning, and I couldn't have known that that moment was going to change my life because that book became a kind of global bestseller. Mm -hmm. It did. It was, the, it was the single best-selling novel of the whole year in the UK in 2008. Uh, it was a massive bestseller in Germany. It sold all over the world, and everything changed after that. And uh, so it seemed I had, you know, leaving funny behind was the way to go. You know? Well, you didn't totally leave funny behind. I mean, the the voice is light. Yeah. It's not, uh, uh, you know, it's not sinister, but still, the the content was was sinister. But at the end of that book, though, you you know. It's resolved, so we think. Now, then we come to this new novel, No Safe House, and you're revisiting yeah. Terry Archer, and things aren't so good. No, it's, it's been seven years since No Time for Goodbye, and, and it was originally my US publisher who said, have you thought about doing a sequel or a follow-up to that book? And and, uh, you know, if the archers, you know, that it's about this family of the archers, if they were real people, they would be pretty pissed with me, I think, that I would <laughs> create all this hell for them seven years ago and then do it to them again. Um, but I started thinking about how in, in thrillers, you know, we get to our conclusion and everybody gets the answers and they off they go into the sunset happily ever after. But I felt that the things that happened to them in that novel were so traumatic that even though they got their answers, there would be these kind of ripples that would go for a very long time, that they would never really get over what happened. And, and I started thinking about the fact that in the first novel, they have a daughter named Grace who's seven. And seven years later, Grace is now the same age that her mother was when the family vanished. Mm -hmm. And I imagined the mother, Cynthia, being the most anxiety-riddled, overprotective, worried mother ever with good reason, considering what happened. And she would be with her own daughter, Grace. Where are you going? When are you coming home? Who are you seeing? 
call me when you get there. And how it would be kind of the law of unintended consequence. The more that she tried to protect Grace, the more Grace would push back, and the more likely it was that Grace herself would get into trouble, which she does mm -hmm. in a very big way. And there were two minor characters in the first novel. There was a thug named Vince who actually manages to help Cynthia find out what happened to her family. And there was his stepdaughter named Jane. And they were minor characters, but people really liked those characters. And I thought, if I do another book, it's going to be, first of all, about this dynamic of this, this tension and this trauma. But I'm going to feature very much on those two characters and bring them back in. So I put those things together and thought, yeah, let's, let's go back to these people and, and see what's happened seven years later and I just make their life hell again. <laughs> Poor souls. I thought you were going to do a, a trilogy about uh, a, another detective. Well, what I am going to do, next year's book, which we think is, we've pretty much settled on a title, is called Broken Promise, be out a year from now. Broken Promise is the first book in a trilogy. And it's going to be three novels that are linked, although each one will have its own kind of separate story, but there's a running backstory, mm -hmm. and it's about... Promise Falls, which is featured in a lot of my books. It's not a real place, but... And Cal Weaver, who is the character from my novel, A Tap on the Window, yeah. who's actually the first novel... It's actually the first novel I've done where the hero is an actual detective. You know, usually they're car salesmen or school landscapers teachers. or school teachers. They're right. And Cal is the main player in book two of the trilogy, which actually I've almost finished the first draft of it. And, and so I cal so we're going to bring back in, into this trilogy, we're going to see characters from uh, Too Close to Home, Never Look Away, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the other books that have come out all, and they're all coming back into this, into this trilogy. And so we're going to see some of these people that we've seen before. It's not quite in the sense of it being a series, but I was very eager to bring Cal back because in Tap on the Window, Cal, things don't work out well for Cal. And I thought, well, I have to, I have to go back to him and, and see how his life is coming along, too. And which one of the books has your brother in it? Trust Your Eye. Well, Trust Your Eye. None of them have my, none, none of the books actually have my brother in it. They're and he's, remotely and, based but, on. But he's here tonight. Um, but, uh, but there's a character in Trust Your Eyes that has little bits of shadings that I learned a lot from my brother. And, and, uh, and there's a character who's a little bit, a bit, a bit sort of influenced by, by him. And, uh, and, there's a little, and that book is dedicated to him. And uh, that's the one that's going to be made into a film. Well, Trust Your Eyes um, is, is, when Trust Your Eyes came out two years ago, it was the, there was an immediate bidding war between Warner Brothers and Universal for it. And Warner Brothers got it, and they recently renewed the option on it. And they're on something like the third draft of a screenplay of the screenplay, and they, it's as they say, in active development. I'll believe it when I'm sitting in a theater, <laughs> and the credits roll, and it's there, you know, and it'll probably have my name on it, but it'll be about a shark on a beach or something. <laughs> and, and, but so that's that's happening. Uh, I had another one. Uh, I've had a, a uh, Never Look Away was optioned by Sony for the idea of making it into a TV series, but I don't know if that's going anywhere. And it looks like one of the other books, The Accident, may be headed for, or has been optioned for um, television in France. Um, books, my books do really, really well, among other places, in France. And uh, there may be a series out of that. But like as I say, when I turn on the TV, <laughs> who does that anymore? That's like, <laughs> there's a kid of the 60s. I'm turning on a television. You do that. If that, when I see it, you know, I'll believe it. Well, it'll premiere at TIFF. Of course. <laughs> That's right. You'll and all will, be there. And we will be able to get tickets. We'll be here. <laughs> <laughs> and you were also, as well as Ross McDonald being a mentor, Margaret Lawrence was a mentor of yours as well. You studied with her at uh, Trent, I think. She was a fabulous mentor to me. When, when I was at Trent, she was writer-in-residence for a period of that time. And... And I, all I had, I'd read like one of her short stories in high school or something, but I thought, here's, the bear. Somebody, here's somebody who gets paid money to write books. I got to go talk to her. So I went to see her and brought her all of these sort of crime novellas I was writing at the time. And, and, 
and so you know, you, and she would meet later, and she'd critique, and we'd talk. And we became very, very good friends, and then she became very good friends with my with my wife Nitha, and we she was just wonderful. And it was, and of course, the first semester she was there was the sort of um, end of the school year, and I, she'd read all my stuff, and I felt sort of badly that she'd read all of my stuff, and I hadn't read anything of hers, <laughs> and so. Over the summer, I read, you know, Rachel, Rachel, and Fire Dwellers, and, and, uh, and the Stone Angel, and all these sort of books, not Ra Just of God, which became a movie called Rachel, Rachel. And so when I, she was thought I was the biggest jerk ever, because when I came back in the fall, I said, you know, I felt bad that you were reading all my stuff, I had read yours, but I read your books over the summer, they're pretty good. <laughs> not bad. <laughs> I, I had a lot of merit. She was great. I mean, she was, she was really wonderful to us, and, and uh, was a very good friend, and, uh, and relentlessly encouraging. You know, very great. good. Well, you've touched on it, but I think people would like to know the saga of Bob Cajun. Well, How you got to Bob Cajun? When, well, as, by the time I was turning three or four, three or four years old, my parents moved to Canada. We actually moved to Clarkson, part of Mississauga, and... And my father was a commercial artist. He was hired by, remember, we would all remember Charles Templeton. Charles Templeton's brother, William, ran an advertising agency. And my dad was hired by them. And he was a, an illustrator. And if you were to look at the magazines from the 50s, Life and Look and Saturday Evening Post, and if you were to look at the car ads, there's a very good chance my dad drew those cars. So, but as the 60s progressed, photography took over. And what my dad was good at, nobody wanted anymore. So my parents decided to buy a cottage resort trailer park near Bob Cajun called, swear to God, Green Acres. <laughs> and it had been called that for a long time before the TV show ever came on. And you know, people would come in and they'd say, hey, where's Arnold the pig? And I'd laugh and I'd say, well, I haven't heard that joke since like an hour ago. <laughs> um, and so we had this business on Pigeon Lake um, of, of you know, this resort business. Resorts sounds high, very high end. It was not a resort. <laughs> we had housekeeping cabins with no inside running water or conveniences and a central outhouse and, and uh, rented boats and all that stuff. And, and I, uh, in effect, took over running it at the age of 16 when my, my father died. And so I ended up running it. I mean, my mom managed it, but I did essentially all the work. And so... It was an interesting experience. And you know, you had this kind of rotating cast of characters of people who came in and came out and they came back every year. And, and that back in 2000, I wrote a memoir about it called Last Resort but, that McClellan Stewart published. I, I called it Last Resort because my father, I think, was not, it was a business my mom really wanted to run. And my dad, I don't think, ever really wanted to be running, as he called it, a fish camp. <laughs> And he, said, and he said to me one time, he said, this place is my last resort. <laughs> and it always seemed like a natural title for the book. <laughs> and so I essentially took over running it at 16. And, and, but when I was I, at the age of 22, I found the girl in my dreams. And I thought, I'm getting married. I'm leaving. And I don't want to stay and run this place. And I got a job at the Peterborough Examiner. And my mom ended up hiring people to do things like bury the fish guts, which... <laughs> You really she kept on running it. You don't really need a BA for that. Um, she ran it. She kept it for another for about five years. She kept it for another five years, and then, uh, and then she eventually sold it. But it was an interesting experience. I think it was, I think that experience defined me more than anything else in my life. I mean, the fact of being at this place and running this business and having all of this responsibility at the age of 16 that I had never expected to have that that was, I think, more than anything else, shaped completely who I am. And, uh, and I, I mean, I swear to God, to this day, I still dream at least once, a, a one night a week, that I'm still running that place. <laughs> like, it just imprinted on me on a way that you cannot imagine. Like a chick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Picked your way out of that egg, and it's what you see. Oh. Well, it's, but you must have had, uh, when you say a rotating cast of characters for a writer, this is an endless supply. It was great. I mean, at the, when I was in my, like I say, in my late teens, I was writing detective novels, and one of them was based, and the, the ones I was writing were based on a man who came to the camp every year 
who looked just like Edward Asner from the Mary Tyler Moore show back then. <laughs> and he was a private detective. From, he worked in Buffalo. And he, was, and he was, you know, I mean, one of the interesting things about when I was at the camp after my dad died was there were all of these men who took me under their wing and were kind of surrogate fathers. And they showed me how to do plumbing repair and do some carpentry and how to do this. And, and, they, and they hung out with me, and I hung out with them. And one of them was, was this guy who was, a, who was a detective. And he used to tell me stories. And I thought, wow, that's so cool. And I would incorporate those into the, into the stories that I was writing at that time. But there were just all these amazing people. And I think that it was, you know, at the time, I just thought, wow, this is really a raw deal. My dad's dead, and I'm running this place, and my mom's dumping all this stuff on me. But, you know, years go by, and you think, wow, that was, that's good material. You know, <laughs> I think, you know, an absolutely perfect, blissful childhood is a curse to all writers, I think. <laughs> I, well, you know, Ross MacDonald always said, all writers must mind their childhoods. I mean, he, yeah. he actually, he, he said that. Many times, yep. and he certainly mined his oh, I mean, yeah. you know, over and over, uh, but his wasn't nearly as uh, well. It was it was terrible. <laughs> yours 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 was merely. Well, and uh, there were a lot of things that happened to him as an adult and as a father that were that he yeah. mined that were very tragic, you know, and difficult. Yeah, and uh, you know when you were talking about the first four books, I think he wrote seven before he wrote uh, uh, his breakthrough novel. Yeah, he had seven that. Uh, um, uh, and outshone by his wife, who mm -hmm. was a bestseller before he ever That's got, right. got uh, uh, a story printed. So, so you know, it was you know he had he had many issues. Yeah, it was and, you know and and looking back, I mean, it, I I really appreciate now what an immense imposition it was to write him and say, "Would you read my book?" And it's amazing. And, and the fact that he did it was just so generous and so decent. It really is. I mean, he must have had 10,000 letters a month like that. I think, I think part of it was that, I mean, like he was in Santa Barbara, California, and he, and, but his, or his roots, a lot of his roots were in Ontario. Yep. And I think that might have been part of what it was. Here was this kid from Ontario who was wanted to become a writer, and maybe he saw some of that in himself, like he's, that's what he had been. Yeah. You know? Yeah, because he, I mean, he decided to be a writer at 19 yeah. and then uh, um, uh, continued to, uh, to strive for years. So, uh, well, we know what's coming up. We know where you've been. And now we're going to open it up to the audience. And would you please uh, come to the uh, uh, microphone and ask a question? Whatever no you say. no math questions. No please. math questions. <laughs> I, really I can't add, and he can't subtract. So between us, we're. Uh... Um, yeah, I don't know if, anybody, if if the mic was on. I've already heard that, but it was who am I? I don't know if it's not. But the question was, who am I writing for? Like, who do I picture the readers to be, or when I'm writing, who is the audience? You know, who am I writing for? And I honestly, I can't, I don't, I don't really think about that in the writing. I think I'm. I think in many ways I'm writing for, for me, but in the sense I'm writing to keep myself from getting bored. And, and, I, and when I'm writing it, I'm thinking, am I interested? And am I getting bored? And if I'm getting bored, I know that this is not working or this has got to, you know. And I mean, my, maybe, I, I, maybe I have some sort of attention deficit disorder, and that's why I have a lot of twists in the books, because I'm always trying to, you know, it's like I'm always pinching myself to keep, keep myself awake. And, and so, there, so I think in many ways I'm writing for myself to keep myself interested. And that's why I, I'm always trying to end chapters with a little cliffhanger or end them with a twist or something. If that kind of answers that. Yes, out. thank you. When you've decided you don't like something that you've written, you know, at the end of a page, at the end of a chapter, um, you know, a, a, a twist in the plot, and you don't like it, how are you going to go back and rewrite it? How do you decide? Well, it's, I mean, it's funny. It's, I think it's certainly for me one of the toughest things is, is when, you're, when you're the writer and you're the closest to it, I think sometimes you have the, the worst perspective on it. I mean, when I wrote No Time for Goodbye and when I finished it and I printed it all out and the next morning I read the book from beginning to end, the whole thing. This is the book that, you know, did millions of copies. And I read it and I thought, this is the worst book I have ever read. <laughs> and so you, ha you need a bit of distance sometimes. But, but when I... Uh, 
I think what I learned on one book, I did one book a few years ago that didn't work out. Um, and, I, and I wrote this entire novel, and I was under a contract to do a book a year, and I wrote this whole book. And, and there was a little voice in the back of my head that was saying, this isn't working right. But I ignored it, and I thought, oh, I can fix it later. And, and I wrote the whole book, and I realized it couldn't be fixed. It was a mess. Yeah. And I put the whole thing aside, and I did another book. And so what I learned from that was you have to listen to that voice. If the voice is saying it's not quite working, then you have to stop. And then you have to go back and reassess and see if it's working and, and maybe rewrite and so forth. So when I get to the end of a page, or sometimes I'll, you know, I'll go to bed at night or the next morning I get up and I think that what I did yesterday wasn't quite right and I need to fix it. I'll go back and, and deal with it and, uh, and take another run at it. But, um, and a lot of times too, I'll, 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 I'll know that there's more work to do, but I, it's not so critical that I have to fix it today. I'll think I'll get the book done and the first draft, and then I'll go back and I'll fix those things as I go through it again. Um, but I think the biggest thing is to listen to that voice. And if the voice says there's a problem, stop. Are you getting that voice at the beginning of the novel? Oh, well, you can get it all the way. I mean, but if there's a real problem in a book, I mean, if, if that voice is telling you, if you're only on chapter one and the voice is saying there's a problem already, <laughs> <laughs> that's not good. That might not, be, that might not be the best book to do. Um, you know, I, sometimes I think writing a book is a bit like a journey. And, and as, you're, as you're going, you know, if you want to get to here and you're starting here, and there are all these little forks in the road, and, and some of them you can sort of make a little diversion and go and so forth. But if you, if you make a wrong turn near the end of the novel and you go <laughs> off here, well, you don't have that much to fix to get back and, and fix it. But if you make a wrong turn here, by the time you get to the end of the book, you're up there. That's a crisis. And, <laughs> and, and I've, I've been there. <laughs> you know, what do you do with characters who don't work? Well, I've had characters that didn't work, and then I've, you know, I go back and I re reshade them. I, fixing characters isn't sometimes necessarily as hard as fixing a plot problem. Yeah. And it's funny, when I did Trust Your Eyes, I had a character in it. There was a woman in the book, and um, uh, the, my editor said, you know, she's really not working, and maybe you don't even need her in the last half of the book. So I said, okay. So I rewrote the book. And I dropped her from the last half of the book. But in the first half, I rewrote her you know, mm. to make her better. Then I gave it back to my editors. And they said, wow, she's a great character now. You should put her into the back <laughs> of the book. <laughs> Which, she can never win. <laughs> you know, you just can't, you just can't win. I, I, have to, I have to say that um, you know, every book that I, about editors, I want to talk, I just say something about editors. Every book that I have done has gotten way better by working with editors. I mean, I know there's a lot of authors who say, you know, you can't touch one word of my stuff. It's, it's all sacrosanct. Don't wrong, touch one. Wrong, wrong. And they, and boy, I think, wouldn't it be great to be like that? Because then you just write it once and it's gone and you never have to think about it again. But every, anything that, anything can be better. It can always get a little better. And if you take that attitude, I think you miss an opportunity to make your book better. And I don't think, I mean, I think some editors may enjoy making my life hell, but we're really kind of all on the same, we all have the same goal, and that's to make the book as, to be the best book that it can be. So I listen to editors. I often don't want to hear what they have to say. And when, I, and when they get, there's nothing worse, for me the worst part of writing is that time between when you hand in your novel and you wait to hear from your editors, the ver when they read the first draft. That to me is the worst part of the whole process, because you're just waiting. You know, it's like having, it's like walking around with a piano hanging over your head. <laughs> And you know that the, that the line is going to snap at any moment. Anyway. Well, I read those books that don't get edited, and I can tell you, wait for the editor, writers. He's right. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering about sort of your process, if you will. I'm, I'm, I may be halfway, I may be two-thirds of the way, or I may be a third of the way through writing something that I'm really having a lot of fun with. And I'm working with a a coach who's been enormously helpful. But she keeps saying, okay, well, well what's going to happen next? And I keep saying, well, my hand hasn't told me yet because I sort of sit down and it just starts happening and then all of a sudden I'll go, oh, where did that come from? And mm -hmm. it's taking turns all over the place. And 
you know, she's talked about doing up grids and chapter things, and I don't seem to be able to do that, and I don't know how weird that is. Well, I, every, I mean, I've, one of the great things about doing this for a living is I've gotten to know an awful lot of really well-known crime writers, and I haven't met any two that do this the same way. Yeah. We all kind of have different approaches, or, or you know, and we all doing a bit of the same thing, but everything different. I mean, I did an event with Lisa Gardner, who's really wonderful, and she said she just starts writing, she doesn't plan. And, and we were doing an event kind of like this, and I said, well, your first chapter foreshadows what happens at the very end of the book. She says, well, yeah, but I wrote it afterwards. You know, <laughs> and, and so, and then other authors, they plan out every single chapter. They know what they're all gonna be before they start. They, they map it all out, they do pay, pages and pages of outline, and so everyone has a different process. I'm sort of in the middle. I mean, I, I don't know what every chapter that's coming up is gonna be, but I know where I wanna end up. I, I kind of know who's, who done what and what forces are happening in the background to make these events happen. And so I like to know that before I begin, but a lot of times I don't know what the next chapter may be until I get to it. But when I was doing my, the very first novel, which was one of the funny Zach thrillers, and it was called Bad Move, and when I was, when I was writing that, that very first book, and I, and I had gotten in touch with my agent, Helen, and she was reading the book kind of as I had written, I'd written half of it. And, and she said, who did it? And I said, well, it's either. <laughs> and I got some of the best advice I'd ever had then. She said, stop and figure it out and then finish it. And that's what I did. And then once I had it sort of figured out, then I was able, I mean, there were still things that when I got to them, they were surprises to me. Like, I didn't know I was going to write that chapter. I didn't know that little thing would happen. But I knew the mechanics of it. Okay. I knew who had done what. Because I think, at least for me, I need to know what everybody did that the reader doesn't know that they did. I need to really need to know that as the writer because it shapes every single thing that they say. So if I know in chapter two that this person who's talking is the killer, I have to be in their head and know that the, every word they say is, is said, they're couching their language this way because they're hiding something. I have to know that um, before, you know, I need to know that. So, but I don't necessarily know every little detail. Okay, so you, you sort of have a, a beginning and a destination and then you kind of yeah, I, I wing do. it a little bit. That's right, I, I, so. I know my beginning, I know my hook, I know where I want to end up, I know kind of roughly the things I may want to have happen. But I can only outline up to a point, then I just have to start writing. Yeah. And then, because I can't see the opportunities that exist in the book until I start writing it. And then I say, oh, I can do this, or I can do this. And those things I wouldn't be able to figure out ahead of time. Okay. And, uh, and so, it's sort of a bit of, it's a bit of a half and half. I mean, I know a lot, I know some of it, but I just can't know all of it. Okay. And just one quick question about working with an editor. Do you ever have it happen where your editor gives you feedback and then you, you just, really, really don't agree, like, um, you know, like with, with Nora, there's been times when she's identified something with a character that, that she didn't like, and I've gone back and tried to make it more reflective of what I feel, but I, yep. I can't do what she said because, I, to me, it just doesn't feel right. Well, I don't, I, I, yeah, I've had times when I disagreed with an editor, and, and, uh, but I can give you an example of how the process has worked for me. So when I wrote a novel called The Accident about four years ago, um, my editor in the UK said, I don't think the ending works, and it's not strong enough or whatever. And he said, I think what would make a really good ending would be, would be this. And I said, that's really stupid. You know, <laughs> that doesn't work at all. But I get why you don't like the existing ending. Like, I get that there's something wrong. I just don't like your solution. So and I started thinking, and I said, well, what about if I did this? And he said, that would work. Okay. So it ultimately was cooperative. And what the, and you know, an editor may not always have the answer, but the editor may be able to identify that there's a problem. Okay. And he'll say, I mean, he's been very, his name is Bill, my editor in the UK. And he's been very honest. He's very funny sometimes, too. He'll say, look, he says, there's a really a problem in this part of the book or in this chapter and I have absolutely no idea how you can fix it. <laughs> Over to you. <laughs> and, 
And that can actually be a great thing about some editors is that editors push you. Yes. And, and you think, well, I've done, the, I've done the best I can do. And then you realize that you can make it better. Yeah. And they push you to, to go that extra mile. And you think, wow, I'm glad that he was a real pain in the butt to me because this book is on the stands now and I'm glad it's not coming out the way it was you know, when I first wrote it. So. Thanks for being so generous. Oh, no problem. I always loved your columns. And at the time, I always wondered, what did your family feel about your family <laughs> columns? Well, the litigation continued. <laughs> <laughs> the thing was, um, a couple things. First of all, I felt that if anybody looked like a fool in the columns, it was me. That, that, that not just to protect everyone else's feelings, but that was also a reflection of reality. So if anybody was going to look foolish, it would be me. And, and, uh, and the other thing was, of course, with the kids, like I, the kids just didn't care. I mean, I remember one time when, uh, when this, this, this really kind of sums it up. One time, Spencer, when Spencer was about 17, he's 30 now. <laughs> Think about that. Gosh, um, that gives you a twinge. I remember when he went to grade school. Yeah, I know. He's, he's been married for two years. I mean, it's... Uh, when he was about 16 or 17, he borrowed the car one day, his mom's car, and he used it to go to, he used it to school. I get a phone call. He says, uh, I don't know how he did this, but um, I've locked the keys in the car and the engine's running. <laughs> Can you come over with the other set? So I go over to the school, and I open up the car for him, you know, and all these kids are going, Hurrah! you know. So I said to him, because it was kind of potentially embarrassing for him, but I said, I'd love to write a column about this. Do you, do you care? He says, no, I don't care. So I wrote the column, and, and so the day that the paper arrives at the house, he's sitting there having breakfast, and I said, here's the column about, uh, about you locking the keys in the car if you want to read it. And he said, well, why would I read it? I was there. <laughs> like, I know what happened. <laughs> and that's kind of how it was. Like, they were totally blasé about it. And they'd grown up with it when... when, when um, Paige was an absolute Spice Girls fanatic. And I wrote about this at the time. And, and uh, when they came to Toronto, um, we had gotten tickets, and the star asked if Paige would write a review of the Spice Girls concert. And, so, you know, and her first question was, you know, what does it pay? <laughs> and I said, gonna pay, they're going to pay 150 bucks. She said, I'm in. You know, and so, so, she wrote a, so she wrote a review. And the morning that the paper came, and on the front of the entertainment section, there was a little review by Paige Barclay with a picture of Paige Barclay. And I went up to, you know, she was still asleep to show her the paper. And I said, do you want to see this? She said, oh, I'll look at it later. <laughs> like, she'd been in the paper so much, she just didn't care. So they were pretty, pretty blasé. Uh, Neetha, my wife, she did, I made her up. She doesn't exist. <laughs> So she, she couldn't be upset because she was a complete fiction. I only, but, you know, there must have been something in, the, in that detective from Bob Cajun that you knew how to open the door on a locked car with the engine running. Oh, no, I had, uh, yeah, I did. I, I had a, an extra set of keys. <laughs> pretty, pretty, I never thought of that. Pretty, I thought you popped pretty, the thing. Pretty freaking brilliant. Popped the door. <laughs> that, was a, that, was, that was a regular Houdini. At I my just, house, they'd have called the cops. <laughs> Uh, I have two questions, if I may. One is now, given your, the success of your books and the certain notoriety, uh, has there any, been any thought given to reprinting all of your humorous stuff that you did for the start? Uh, well, I, there's certainly more enthusiasm here than anywhere else. Um, <laughs> you know, here's the thing. I, did, I actually did one book of columns that came out in 97. But um, the thing is, with books of columns, first of all, probably at least 50% or more of those columns were related to, to news events. So in a book, they would be point, nobody would care because they're tied into something you know, that George Bush did or that Brian Mulroney did or something. Nobody would care now. It's too old. And, and there's not a lot of enthusiasm from publishers to, to do books of columns. And with, you know, because ultimately people look at it and think, well, I did read that once. <laughs> so why would I pay good money to read it again? 
So I don't think, I think a, a book of columns is, is highly, is actually never going to happen. I was going to say highly unlikely, but it's way beyond that. Um, you, you said before, previously that you got, you're under contract to do a book a year. Now, is a book a year part of your natural rhythm of writing? And if there is now a contract in place, how does that affect how you write psychologically? Do you feel that pressure as opposed to a previous time when perhaps you didn't have an obligation to one a year? Well, first of all, when you write, as Margaret would, would know, you know, when you write crime fiction as opposed to so-called, quote, literary fiction, there's a kind of expectation of a, of a book a year. Yeah. Everybody waits every year. Where's the new Louise Penny? Is the new Michael Connolly out? Is the new Lee Child out? Because you were waiting for that book to come out every year. So when you do this kind of writing, that's what people really are looking for. And I don't mind, I find a book a year as a, as a, as a it is a kind of a treadmill, but I don't find that you know, too daunting. The only thing more stressful than a contract to do a book a year would be if they didn't give you a contract to do a book a year. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really stressful. If they said, no, nah, we, really, we don't really need one next year, that would, be, that would keep me awake at night. But you know, when you've spent 30 years in newspapers and you're used to deadlines, and yes, books are slightly longer than the columns, but when you're used to that kind of regimen and the routine of you get up and you write every day and that's your work, it's, I, don't, I don't find a book a year that frightening. Now, there are some authors who actually are doing two books a year and some even, sometimes even more. That would be, I couldn't do that. But, um, but a book a year, I think, is, is pretty manageable. I don't find that too overly stressful. Does a contract come at the each year, is it renewable? Or well, do what you they have a certain generally what publishers do is they, they do usually do three book deals. At least with me, I I do three book contracts, and so I'm good for the next. I'm I'm signed up now, like 2017 or so, and probably sometime in 2016 they'll come back and say, well, do you want to do three more? And so you you sort of plan ahead like that, and uh, so it's usually three at a time, and and uh, but like I say, it would be. If they decided, no, nah, well, we'll do, we'll do one, I would start to worry. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Ruth Rendell could manage two books a year. I never understood how. Was they both under her name, or did she do Barbara Vine? Barbara Vine. She would yeah. do Barbara Vine and Ruth Rendell. And yeah. you know, there's there's been years when Michael Connolly has come out with two, and and I don't, you know, I I don't think I could quite do it. I think I could do it if. I mean, there have been years in which I did write two books. And in fact, this year is one of them because I'm writing a trilogy. Mm -hmm. And because I'm concerned that I'll get to book two or three and think of something great that needs to be set up in book one. And I really only have until the end of this year to tinker with book one. So I wrote the first book in this trilogy between January and April. And I'm now three quarters of the way or more through the first draft of book two. And, but, it's when you couple that, when you add that also to, you know, touring and promotion, and the fact that now I find that my books are there's a lot more editing now than there ever used to be. When I was writing the Zach books, there was very little editing on those because the editors would look at them and think, well, we're only going to sell ten copies anyway. How much work do we really want to spend? <laughs> how much how much time do I want to spend on this? <laughs> but now that the books are selling, you know, hundreds of thousands of copies, it's like. Every chapter has to hit. Every yeah. page has to work. So there's more, uh, more work involved in them than there used to be. It's not a question. It's a statement. I just fin I finished your new book, and I loved it. I couldn't figure out how you were going to end it. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> oh, I'm not. I'm not going to. <laughs> and I was reading it and thinking, what's he going to do? What's he going to do? And when I finally got to it, I thought, I guess you had no choice, but I, I, was, I was really taken with it when, I, when all the things that were happening in the book, and I thought, okay, here we are. What are we, what's it going to do? And so, um, and there is, because, I mean, I, like, not all of them, but I mean, some of the books do, you do think they're over. A lot of times you'll think the book's over, it's all figured out, and then you get to like three pages from the end, and you find, no, it's not. Well, over. well, yeah, exactly. That's kind of part of what was happening here, and I thought, well, wait a minute. Maybe there's, and I realized there were a few more pages to read. Yeah. And then when you, you tied it up very nicely, but I must say it, it was intriguing. Well, thank you for that. I, and when I did Trust Your Eyes uh, a couple years ago, that book, you really do think it's completely over. And then three paragraphs from the very end on the very last page, you find out 
that it's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I've ever had, held a surprise that was quite that late in a book. But I really love having, I like, I like to do endings that are kind of um, unsettling sometimes. I like you to, to get to the very end and go, well, holy crap, what are they going to do now? You know, it's even, not tied up in a bow, and that's, no. what, that's the part that I I mean, like, you get yeah. your answers. You know what happened. I don't want you to leave it so you don't know what happened. But once you know what happened, it's like, well, what on earth will they do with this information that they have now? I like doing that. Thank um, you. Yeah. You know, and sometimes, I mean, I, I, just, I just like, ha I mean, first of all, it's a crime novel. Bad things happen to people. And I find uh, endings that are perfectly happy and everything gets all wrapped up. I just don't find that believable, and I don't find it very interesting. Thanks very much. I Thank really you. enjoyed it. Thank you. Anyone else? Nope, oh, yeah, there's somebody else. Now that you're the famous uh, author, how do you handle the influx of requests from aspiring writers to critique their work? Yeah. <laughs> if she sends you a manuscript, you're going to read it? <laughs> I'm not going to do that. And what email should I look for when... Uh, you know, it's, it's um, and you know, when I, when I wrote to Ross McDonald, if you wanted to reach an author, you had, to, you had to actually write a letter, you had to figure out where to send it, you had to figure out, you know, you had to get the publisher's address and send it to them, and then you mailed it to them, and that took a week, and then they would send it off to the author, and that might take another week or two or more, and then maybe a month or six weeks or something later, the author would get your letter, and then he'd think, well, well, maybe I'll answer him. And they'd write back. That would take another week. Now, someone sits at home saying, boy, I think Linwood Barker should read my book. <laughs> <laughs> would you read my book, Mr. Barclay? And so the number of requests you get like that, are, it's considerable. And so I'm not able to sort of pay it back quite the way I would have liked to, the way that Ross McDonald was for me. And I've just reached the point where I'm... I mean, I get, I get sent a lot of books by my own publisher, uh, my own publishers who say, would you have time to read this and maybe blurb this book? And, and in, in the piles like this, and even those I generally don't get to. And so the only things I ever look at are, I will choose usually from the, the stuff that my publisher might send, you know, so on, so, but it's not very often. I've, and I'm not a hugely fast reader. So when somebody sends you something, um, you know, to read it, it's like it's a major commitment to try to find the time to do it. And of course, and, and just as a sort of to let you know, when the International Festival of Authors in, in October, I've been asked to interview um, James Elroy at that event. And so they've sent me James Elroy's book to read, which is 700 and some pages. <laughs> it might be the only thing I get to read between now and the end of October. So, so I'm not able to look at stuff, you know, but, um, but I do still get requests, you know, to look at things. Thank you. I recently stumbled across a collection of short stories. I think it's called Face Off, which is oh, yeah. um, uh, thriller authors who were paired together in unlikely combinations, I think was the premise behind it. And, and the, the stories are, are terrific. What, uh, and you, you did one of them. And I just wanted to ask you, what was that? like writing with another author, um, and, uh, and I'm sorry, I can't forget, I forget. It was Raymond who, Curry. Oh, and yeah, so um, I belong to an organization called the International Thriller Writers, and they have a big convention every year in New York, and the, the writer Steve Barry had this brainchild of, to, get, to put out a book that Simon & Schuster published, and it would have 11 short stories, and each story would be written by two well-known thriller writers who would take their characters and put them together. So Lee Child did one with, with um, Joe Finder and their characters meet. Michael Connolly did one with Dennis Lehane. And so it was Harry Bosch and, and was it Kenzie, Patrick Kenzie? And they asked me to do one with Raymond Curry. So that was a very a different kind of process for me. I think I'm better working alone. Um, <laughs> But it was interesting because, I mean, the way we did it was I would write, because they had to be about 9,000 words each. So I would write 1,000 words or more and send it to Raymond, and then he would write 1,000 and he would send it back. So we just would see where the story went. And that was the way we did it. And it was an interesting process. And it was actually really nice to be asked to be part of that book 
with all those, you know, those writers. But um, I, I don't know if I'd do it again. But I was glad to be part of it. It was a neat experience. And, it was, and the book's done really, really well. Uh, it's done quite well. And so uh, it, was, it was kind of a neat thing to do. It, it was a lot of fun to read. I mean, the, the, the combinations were terrific. And, and yours was terrific, too. Oh, thank I mean, you. Just <laughs> how, how it came together. Good, thanks. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks. Gosh, I just realized, Linwood, I forgot to ask you, where do you get your plots from? <laughs> where do I get my ideas from? Croatia. <laughs> you were joking about this. You know, that's kind of, and the thing is, it's a legitimate question, but it's the one that authors get the most, and it's the, it's the one they don't have an answer for. You know, the old, the old, where do you get your ideas? And most of us don't know. Like, they just happen. I mean... I get ideas sometimes, you know, you just kind of wake up at two in the morning and it's just there. The whole thing, it's just there, it comes whole. And, and I find when you look for an idea, sort of, and uh, deliberately, like you're thinking, well, what could I write and what if I did this or what if, I, you know, and you start looking at the paper for inspiration or looking for things. I find that's a much more difficult process. Yeah. That if you just kind of wait for it to happen, something just comes. And I think that's why, I mean, when people ask that question, where do you get your ideas? I think it's as though they think, well, there's sort of a trick to it. You just sort of go to Ideas Are Us, <laughs> and you get an idea. And, but, that's, but the reason that we're authors is because we get these ideas, and we have no idea where they come from. They just happen. Just. And thank heavens. And Croatia. I mean, and a lot of times, too, you know, I mean, when, you're, when you're up against, you know, like it's, it's time for, you know, it's your, it's, the contract says that it's time to write another book, and it's time to get going, and you think, I sure hope that idea is going to come soon. <laughs> I really need that idea to come soon. You know? and sometimes it takes a while. And sometimes you get one and you think, ah, that one's not going to fly. It's just not good enough. But that's, I find too that, you know, I was at a really neat event in, in Decatur outside of Atlanta last week. And two writers I really like, uh, C.J. Box and, and Ace Atkins. Ace, who has taken over writing the, the Spencer novels th through the Robert mm -hmm. Parker estate, and they're fantastic. He's doing a really nice job. And, and I asked them, I said, does it get easier? And it's funny, C.J. Box, Chuck Box said, yeah, it does after you've done a lot of books. And Ace Atkins said, it gets harder. Mm -hmm. And I agree with him, because when I think there's, every time you do a book, you feel you want it to be better than the one that came before it. You want every book to be better than the one before, and that's very difficult sometimes, especially if you do one you're really happy with. You think, now I gotta follow this one. And, and so it's, it's a challenge to come up with something that you think is going to be as good as the one that came before it. When, you, when I wrote columns, you know, uh, you could write a column, I mean, there was the, once or twice out of all those thousands of columns, I did some that were really poor. Um, I did a few that were pretty bad. But you know, you could write a column and you think, God, that column just stunk. But there'll be another one in two days. Mm -hmm. And so you had a chance to redeem yourself soon. But when you do a book a year, if you do one that's terrible, there's a whole year that that book's sitting there. And people are reading it, wow, this was a turkey. <laughs> and, 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 and you know, if you read one column and you think that one wasn't very good, but you'll probably still read this guy's column two days later again. Yeah. But you might think, that book last year was so bad, I'm not buying another one. Yeah. So that, there's that kind, of, that kind of pressure to make every book better. And I, used to, I, used to, I would joke with my, my UK editor, I'd say, I would say how, many, how many of these do I have to write before I can just write crap and just mail it in? <laughs> he said, 15. Being rather facetious, he said, 15. Not totally facetious. No, because he, <laughs> I was at book nine then. He said, 15. <laughs> I'm now writing book 15, so he's probably going to change that. <laughs> well, I can tell you right now that book 15 is the best Linwood Barclay yet, and I read them all. <laughs> so thank you. thank you, Linwood. Thank you very much. Thanks, Margaret. That was great.